Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Big Blue Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Voltz, a sophomore here at SUNY Fredonia. So a lot to get to today. Of course, I think everybody, anybody tuning in today is probably waiting for me to, you know, come on here and scream and cry and whine about the uh, Bills game on Sunday, which I promise I will later because I do have plenty of thoughts on that game. And I have plenty of thoughts on the weekend of sports as a whole. In summary, it was not a very good sports-related weekend for me at all. And if anybody listened to the fifth quarter on Monday night, uh, Mitch Parker and I talked about that. And we talked about, you know, with last weekend being rivalry week in college football, how our games did not exactly go the way we wanted them to go, per se. Mine really did not go the way I wanted it to go, and I think that my entire family can attest to that after I was, you know, eating Thanksgiving leftovers for dinner on Saturday night, just intently staring down at my table, you know, incredibly deeply sad and wondering where it all went wrong. But anyways, I'm going to start with a different college sports, and that's, of course, Blue Devil Sports. So the women's basketball team went into last night's game on the road, unbeaten on the season. They got off to a 4-0 start, and... They were up against, you know, they had, a, they had a really tall task last night. They traveled to Ohio to take on John Carroll. John Carroll, for anybody who's not quite, you know, familiar with a lot of these different programs, John Carroll is a very good basketball program, both men's and women's. They're for, like, the, you know, non, I guess, D1 level, so to speak. John Carroll's pretty good. So... You know, it it was a tall task going in for this women's team. Uh, The Blue Devils ultimately fall 70 to 53. And it kind of, the issue that happened in this game was that John Carroll really jumped out to just a huge lead early on. I mean, it was 22 to 8 at the end of the first quarter. The rest of the game, the Blue Devils really stayed with them. But unfortunately, they were not able to overcome, you know, falling that far behind early on in the game. And that's, I think, probably going to be a key point for Coach Cartmill moving forward is, you know, you can't fall behind early in games because then you're playing the rest of the game. You're you're playing catch-up the rest of the time. And that's, you know, that's, it, that's not a great strategy for winning. You know, when you're playing, uh, uh, maybe it works for the Philadelphia Eagles. Clearly it works for the Philadelphia Eagles. Little side note here, I saw like Jalen Hurts' stats when the Eagles are winning versus when they're losing. It's unbelievable. It like it's crazy. Like he actually, when the Eagles have the lead, Jalen Hurts has more interceptions than touchdown passes, which is crazy. It it's something like he has like seven touchdowns compared to nine picks when the Eagles are losing or when the Eagles are winning. And then when they're losing, he has like 22 touchdowns and two interceptions or something like that. Like, it's it's insane. But anyways, the Blue Devils fall last night 70 to 53. Uh, they only had two players in double figures. You know, John Carroll again, they're good defensively, right? So, you know, it, it's that. And the Blue Devils also only shot for the game. The Blue Devils only shot 38.5 percent. And again. That's not always the biggest recipe for success, you know, especially when they were only two of 22 from three, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to sit here and say, oh, you got to make your shots, you know, because, well, obviously they know they need to make their shots. Like they're trying to make their shots, but sometimes that sort of luck, I mean, basketball can be a cruel game. I know I'm terrible at basketball. Oh my gosh. If you put me on the team, I'd get smoked out there. But sometimes basketball, like I said, can be just wickedly cruel because, you know, sometimes you have a great look from three and it's a good shot and it just rims out, you know, like that, that does happen sometimes. So the blue devils, it was their first loss of the season though. They dropped to four and one. And they are on the road. Their first SUNYAC matchup of the season is this Saturday at 2 p.m. They are on the road taking on Buff State. And there's an opportunity to pick up a first SUNYAC win for the Blue Devils. You know, get back in the win column. And I mentioned it on uh, News at Noon on Monday, and I'll mention it again today probably, that the Blue Devils, this women's team, 
their next win this year will match their total, their win total from last season. They were five and nineteen last year. They're off to a four and one start this year. So they're on the road against Buff State on Saturday. They've got two home games next week. They're home against Alfred on Tuesday night at six thirty, and then they're home against Houghton on Thursday night at six. As long as provided that I don't have any other, you know, pressing things that I need to get to, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be loud. It's going to be fun. And hopefully we can come away with a pair of wins that week. And then they got about a month off and then they've got some SUNYAC games. And that's the interesting thing about, you know, being a student athlete is that they keep playing over break. Some teams do. Some teams keep competing over break. One team that does not, though, is the men's and women's swimming and diving teams. So before we left for break, they hosted a six-team, well, I guess five other teams, Invitational. It was against Penn State Baron, Alfred State, which is different from Alfred U, Baldwin Wallace, Pitt Bradford, and Brockport. And I mentioned that because Alfred State and Alfred U get confused a lot. So, again, I mentioned on the show before that the men's and women's, sw- the or just the men's team specifically, it's kind of a struggle considering the fact that they only have four on their team. You know, and I I equated it to my experience with some other high school cross-country programs where they didn't have enough runners to score as a team. And that's when it becomes much more about individual performance than about what you can do as a team because, well, let's face it, if you don't have a very big team, you're probably not going to be able to do very much. If you're going up against somebody who has like 14 or 15 swimmers and divers, you're not going to be able to do very much. So, again, the men's team, you know, they ended up placing sixth out of six teams, but they strung together some points. I mean, they had, you know, some decent finishes. And, again, that's what it's all about. And it sounds cliche. It really does. I understand. But it's certainly true that that's where it becomes much more focused on that individual performance. That's where you go from meet to meet looking at, okay, What can we do to have one particular swimmer set their personal best? You know, what can they do to better themselves? And what can, even though it's a small team, what can everybody else do to sort of lift up their teammates and make everybody better? That's kind of the beauty of having a big team is that you are more at liberty to have some competition and people get better through competition. You don't really have that chance when you only have four, but you do have the opportunity then to, I think as a coach, if you've got a smaller team, that's when I think you really can focus more on your individual athletes and focus on, okay, from a coach's perspective, what do I need to do to make them the best version of themselves that they can possibly be? And I have no doubt that that's what coach Bradley is thinking in his mind right now. The women's team Ended up finishing fifth out of six teams. They, uh, you know, again, the women's team, it's obviously bigger than the men's team, but still not a huge team. So the point still stands about individual performance and seeing what you can do to make each athlete the best version of themselves. Now, out of the men's basketball team, they had a tough one on Monday night. They were on the road against Chatham. They lost 89 to 68. It's their second straight loss. And again, it kind of, kind of the same thing with the women's game, how they fell behind early. They were able to stay with them in the later goings of the game. But again, because they fell behind early, now you're spending the rest of the game playing catch up. They were down 39 to 24 at the half. And again, they were only outscored 50 to 44 in the second half. So the second half was very close. And the Blue Devils put up some points in that half. But, unfortunately, you are not going to be able to, it's just, it doesn't work if you're playing catch-up the whole time, so to speak. Uh, They only had two players in double figures. Ferdinand did as well. And, I mean, they shot 44.1%, which is not bad. I mean, like, it's, that's that's not bad. I mean, Chatham didn't shoot much better. Chatham only shot 43.3%. Actually, no, Fredonia shot better than Chatham did. You know, so it just becomes a matter of, 
I don't know. You know, you know, I understand that, yes, you've lost back-to-back. Yes, I'm sure they're frustrated. They've dropped to two and four. But I think that you've got to I, – I still think that even though they've lost a couple, I still think for this Blue Devils team, you have to look at where they were last year compared to where they are now. This team was 2-23 and 23 last year. Their only two wins came over Buff State, who won one game the entire season. So to see them – you know, I know they're two and four, and it's like, okay, you know, you've lost back to back, you've lost three of your last four, eh, maybe, you know, maybe, or you've lost, you know, four of your last five. Eh, you know, that's not, things aren't great, but I think, again, you can't overlook the progress that this team has made. I mean, out of their four losses, their first two losses were by a combined eight points. They lost their first two losses were by four points each. Then over break, they lost to Pitt Bradford by seven. So this was their first loss by double digits. Again, I I really think that there is room for this Blue Devils team to keep growing. They've improved so much since last year. I absolutely think that Fredonia has a shot at making it into the Suniac playoffs. I absolutely think so. With the way that they play to start the season, if they can regain some of that, I absolutely think they have a chance at going to the Suniacs for sure. They are actually, they're playing tonight. They're on the road. It's an exhibition game. They're playing against Lemoyne, which is up in the Syracuse area. Uh, that tips off at 7 o'clock. Then they're on the road. Their first Suniac game of the season on Saturday at Buff State at 4. Again, this is a team that Fredonia beat twice last year, and they didn't beat anybody else. So... That's a game that the Blue Devils do have to be careful because they're, metaphorically speaking, they're probably going to have a target on their back from Buff State. Buff State, they're going to want revenge over these guys. It's the battle by the lake. You know, it's always always a huge deal when Fredonia and Buff State play, no matter the sport. Fredonia got them twice last year. You know Buff State's going to be coming at them. They're not home for a while, though, actually. And the next time the Blue Devils are home is when we're on break. It's Friday, January 12th at 7.30 when they take on New Paltz in a conference matchup. They also host Oneonta at 4 on that Saturday. So they've got a lot of road games coming up. We're getting into Suniac play. I mean, they got the game against Buff State. Then starting on January 5th when they travel to Plattsburgh, it's all Suniac opponents for the rest of the season. So that's when... You really start getting into the heat of your season. You get into the thick of it. I think there's an opportunity to pick up some wins. I really do. I I think that this team is good, and I think that they can figure it out, get back on the win track. I absolutely do. Now, finally, on to the men's hockey team. They have been on a little bit a, I, I you know, don't call it a roll, I guess, but they've been they've been doing pretty steady. They've won two of their last three games. And their loss in there, out of those three, was at Hobart on November 18th. They lost 3-1. to one. Hobart is the defending national champion of Division Three. Fredonia only lost 3-1. to one. It was on the road against the defending national champion, 3-1. to one. That was it. You know, so, again, I know they've had some tough losses, They've had some games where they've, you know, to be honest, more or less come out flat. And I think Coach Meredith would probably agree with that statement. But, you know, you look at when they beat, but when they had the, the series against Buff State back on November 10th and 11th, they played them at home. It was a bad game. They lost four to one. It did not go well. They go to Buffalo the next night and beat them four to one. They were up two nothing like five minutes into the game. You know, then they go to Morrisville that Wednesday and they beat a good Morrisville team five to three. So they're on the road twice as now we're, you know, mostly getting into Suniac play. Hockey still has some non-conference opponents sprinkled in here and there. But this Friday, they're on the road against Geneseo at 7 p.m. Geneseo is the team that knocked the Blue Devils out last year, ended their season. Remember, the hockey team made the Suniac playoffs last year. They made it in as the number six seed, and Geneseo beat them. I can, I'm willing to bet that this hockey team 
there's no way, you know, they remember that. They remember. And there's no way that they're not going to be thinking of that going into the game. They've got two road games as then they head to Brockport on Saturday at uh, 7 o'clock on Saturday. So they've got two tough road contests. They're back at home next weekend. They've got a home Friday night game at 7 o'clock against Potsdam and then Saturday at home at 4 p.m. against Plattsburgh. And then that's it until, you know, we're on break and they've got a few road games while we're on break and then some home games right when we come back. But the men's hockey team at 2-6, and six, they're 2-3 and three in their conference. And again, not the most ideal start, possibly. But I think definitely there's the opportunity there to pick up some wins and really kind of move up the ranks in SUNYAC play. So that'll be it for our talk about Fredonia Sports today. And when I come back, I want to talk about the Sabres because they played one heck of a game at Madison Square Garden against the Rangers the other night, and they want to keep that rolling tomorrow night in the Gateway City. So thanks for tuning in here on Big Blue Sports Podcast here on WCVF 88.9, the campus and community voice of Fredonia.
on the air at 88.9 WCVF. We are the campus and community voice of Fredonia. And welcome back to Big Blue Sports Podcast. Before we continue, I wanted to let you know that Fredonia Radio Systems is having their semesterly radiothon this weekend. The event is 24 hours of live radio where each hour is a different show created by the campus and community members. The event starts this Friday, December 1st at noon, kicking off with the Legacy Show High Noon Friday and ending the next day on December 2nd at noon, finishing off with the Big Cheeseburger Challenge. Make sure to tune into our two stations this Friday and Saturday, WCVF 88.9 and WDVL 89.5. It should be a fun one. Of course, you can catch Mitch Parker and I at 11 a.m. on Saturday for a special edition of the fifth quarter. What we're going to talk about, I don't know. You'll have to tune in and find out. And I should also mention that Parker will be competing on the Big Cheeseburger Challenge. So I hear. So that should be really fun. Radiothon is always an awesome time. Last year, I was on uh, VGS Let's Talk Gaming with Chloe, Hunter, and Alex. I commentated the Mario Kart tournament, which was just a great time. That was awesome. It was so fun. And, yeah, it's just Radiothon is a fun time. It's, I mean, 24 hours of just live straight through radio. You can tune on, tune in at any point, Friday night, Saturday. You can tune in at 4 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, and somebody will be on. I don't have the sheet in front of me, so I don't know exactly who's on. I know that our good friend Brock Papke is on, I think, at 3 a.m. on Saturday for the uh, graveyard shift. But anyways, now pivoting a little bit to the Buffalo Sabres. Now, the Sabres went into the other night's game against the Rangers it, I mean, going into the game, it was like, uh, given how they'd played in recent contests, especially on Saturday, getting smoked by the Devils in New Jersey. I mean, smoked. 7-2. to two. They had 12 shots on goal. It didn't even look like they got off the plane in New Jersey. Like, I don't know who was on the ice at the Prudential Center or whatever the arena in Newark is called now. I think it's still Prudential Center, but I don't know. These arenas change names every two years, and it's impossible to keep track of anything. But, you know, going into that game, it was like, going into the game against the Rangers, I mean, it was like, yeah, I don't know if this is going to go so well. I don't know if this is going to go so well for the Sabres. I'm not really looking forward to this. And I was actually, you know, I, I didn't get a chance to catch the – Beginning of the game, I was, I was, you know, busy getting some things done here and there, but I just kept seeing, I was like, wait a minute, Buffalo scored. It's one nothing. Wait a minute, Buffalo scored again. What's going on? So I turn on the game and all in all, a brilliant performance by the Sabres. Brilliant. They beat the Rangers five to one. Alex Tuck scored two goals. Uko Pekalukin in a net. Holy smokes, was he good. And this is really, this is becoming a thing, you know, for the Sabres, that goaltending last year, as we remember, was very much a concern. It was so, you know, it, it, it was not good last year. It was, you know, Lukanen would have a good run, and then he would just totally fall apart for a while. And Comrie was the same way. Then they brought in Levi at the end of the year, and that kind of stabilized it a little bit, ultimately not enough to make the playoffs. This year, you know, at the beginning of the year was rough. We are starting to see, I mean, Lukanen has put together several games in a row where he has been, like, not just solid like he was last year. He's been legitimately good. Like, really good. And I think that just furthers the notion that goalies are so random. Like literally, it makes no sense. Like goalies, I I can't even like you have your franchise goalies. Yes. In the NHL today, you have your franchise goalies. You have your your Igor Shesterkin or I dropped my pen. You have your your Igor Shesterkin or Ilya Sorokin or Andre Vasilevsky or you know, Connor Hellebuck or somebody like that. Or Jake Ottinger. I should mention Jake Ottinger too. You know, you have your franchise goalies. That's really, those are just about the only like 
franch, quote unquote franchise goalies that you can think of. A lot of times, goaltenders, it's just, you know, goaltenders can be very streaky. They can be very hot and cold. Lukanen is the same way. I mean, some dude named Jim Carrey once won the Vesna Trophy. Not the actor Jim Carrey, a goalie Jim Carrey. I literally have never heard of Jim of a hockey goalie by the name of Jim Carrey ever in my life besides the fact that he won the Vesna Trophy in I think 95 96. Like who is that? Like like goal, goalies like JS Giger, not necessarily a legendary goalie. You ever see his 2003 playoff run? This dude won the Conn Smythe Trophy even though his team lost in the finals. His like the Ducks or sorry, they were they were the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim back then. Even though the Mighty Ducks lost in the finals, Jiguer was still named the Conn Smythe winner, which is the playoff MVP. Like, how in, you never see that. The Conn Smythe winner always goes to somebody on the team that won the Stanley Cup. But 20 years ago, Jiguer was so good in the playoffs that he won it. Goalies are random. Goalies are crazy. And Uko Pekalukinen is no different. This was a big win for the Sabres, though. After getting boat raced in New Jersey, the Sabres had not looked good in several games. And the fact that they were going with 11 forwards and 7 defensemen instead of the traditional 12 forwards and 6 defensemen in every game, you know, there were a lot of questions being asked. With some guys not playing well, you know, with, with Tage Thompson and Jack Quinn both out injured, there were a lot of questions being asked. The Sabres' power play was next level bad for a while. They were good against the Rangers. And they've actually been solid lately. They've been getting a lot better. Their penalty kill has been good all year. Like, are the Sabres, I know it's only one win, but this is on the road against the Rangers who going into this game had the best record in the entire National Hockey League. This is on the road against the league's best team. You beat them 5-1? to one? That's a heck of a game. I mean, that, like, that's an awesome game for Buffalo. They were so good in nearly every facet. And I think it's because they simplified their game. Truth be told, I think they've been thinking too much. You know, on the power play, you've got an open shot lane? Shoot. You know, don't just stand around and pass for 45 seconds, then take one bad shot from the point that gets blocked and they clear the zone. No, you, you know, the Sabres did a remarkable job of getting pucks to the net. They have 39 shots. That's what I've been waiting to see from the Sabres. If there's one thing that I think can definitely improve, though, and I've been saying it since last year, the Sabres do need to get better from the faceoff dot because, you know, it's it's a lot of times I tend to backseat coach when I watch games. You know, I'll stand up and pace and, you know, a, a lot of times I'll say, like, a good offensive zone entry or a good zone possession or a well-set-up power play, it all starts at the faceoff dot. If you lose the faceoff, then you lose control of your plan with what you wanted to do to attack offensively. Or if you're in your defensive zone and you lose the faceoff, then your opponent has control over what they want to do on the offensive end. So I think that, I mean, the, the Rangers absolutely dominated from the faceoff dot. They're a good faceoff team, but, you know, I, I think that Buffalo, and this was a problem last year too, it's not, it's not like a, in overall, like, oh, you know, if, if they don't get better from the faceoff dot, they're going to miss the playoffs again. That's not their main concern. They need to start scoring some more goals if they want to make the playoffs. That's simply put, they need to string together some wins, but that possibility is not out of reach. So with Buffalo's win, they improved to 10, 10 and two overall back at 500 NHL 500, so to speak, you know, they're five, five and two. On the road, they have 22 points. Right now, the Buffalo Sabres are three points out of a playoff spot. 
So I'm not exactly, you know, there were a lot of people that were talking about like, here we go. Sabres are going to miss the playoffs again. And I absolutely had my doubts because, yes, they had played very poorly. That's absolutely true. They had played very poorly. But at the same time, you know, I think that, I I don't know. I, I think that it's still, I'm still saying it's early. You know, like, like the Sabres have played 22 games. They have 60 games left in their season. It's a long road between now and the end of April. We got five months left of hockey. A lot can happen in that span. We remember five years ago when five years ago, right now, the Buffalo Sabres were, I believe, first place in the entire National Hockey League. You know, when they won 10 in a row and we all thought, here we go, this is going to be it. And then they fell apart. You know, they didn't win consecutive games for four months. So I think we see that it is a long season. There's still a lot of hockey left to be played. And do I think the Sabres can make the playoffs? Yes, I absolutely do. Now, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be put in, and they are kind of going to have to, they do have a little bit of a hole that they have to dig themselves out of, but they're also only three points out, you know? So they've really got to string together some wins. You can't afford to lose games, you know, when you're blowing leads, or you can't afford to be, you know, giving up goals with eight seconds left or whatever it was to lose in overtime. You can't do that. You just simply can't. But you're not getting you're not going to win every game, and you're not going to play every night like like they did against the Rangers on Monday. But you know, I, I think that this is a team that right now I think I still think they're hurting without Tage Thompson and Jack Quinn. I really think that some other guys have stepped up. Victor Olafson, I have been very critical of Victor Olafson in the past. You know, I, I thought he had a really bad year last year. I was personally, I would have understood, you know, if I was the GM, I may have traded him last offseason. But I got to give the guy credit. He's played really well the last several games. And, you know, I, I, I really hope I was wrong about him. Same with Yoki Haru. Same with Lukanen, honestly. You know, when I am frustrated with these guys – and I talk about how, you know, I don't think that they're the right fit moving forward. That's my own personal opinion. I hope I'm proven wrong. <laughs> like, like obviously, I hope I'm proven wrong. I'll say flat out, I was wrong about Josh Allen 100%. I wanted Josh Rosen. I'm serious. I wanted Josh Rosen in the 2018 NFL draft. And we'll talk about the Bills here in a minute. But, you know, I think that it's not a bad thing to be proven wrong. No. It just means that you're, you know, you're learning and you're growing, so to speak. And I think that I would love to be proven wrong about these guys. Because if I'm proven wrong, if I'm criticizing somebody and then I get proven wrong, that means they're playing well. Absolutely. I, ho- I hope they prove me wrong. You know, and, and Victor Olofsson recently is doing that. And that's awesome. I love to see it. And I hope that he continues. He's been playing really, really well. Him and Yoki Haru both. I've probably been critical of those two more than anybody else on the Sabres. And they have played well recently. Even in the losses, I think they've played well. So I would really like to see them keep it up. Lukanen is white hot right now. If he can keep that going, this team can absolutely jump back into a playoff spot. Sabres are back in action on Thursday night. They're in St. Louis at 8 o'clock and then in Carolina on Saturday. So it should be, it should be fun. And I'm looking forward to it. So we're going to take a quick break and then I'll come back. And I got to talk about the Bills. I have to talk about the Bills. I don't necessarily want to talk about the Bills, but I have to, of course. So thanks for tuning in to Big Blue Sports Podcast here on WCVF 88.9, the campus and community voice of Fredonia. will be back in a few minutes. I get lost. 
running circles in my mind That's the cost of living the dream as you and I And all our friends are growing up, some are going gray But look at us, we have an easy day can't get enough of WCVF 88.9, can you? Well, in that case, you should check us out on the Fredonia Radio YouTube channel. We upload some of our weekly shows as well as some exclusive content. Listen to the new stuff as well as the old. Search Fredonia Radio on YouTube and subscribe now. Oh, hey, you hear that? It's WCVF 88.9, The Voice. And welcome back to Big Blue Sports Podcast. Well, the time has come to talk about the Bills, so I guess Bills fans cover your ears. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. So the Thanksgiving, first of all, the Thanksgiving games as a whole were, like, terrible. What in the, like, I I fell asleep during, at some point during all three games, I fell asleep because they were all bad. Like, the only game that was even fairly decent was the Packers-Lions game because the Lions made it a little close at the end. But, like, geez, those Thanksgiving games were bad. Oh, my gosh. I mean, yeah, the Lions losing to the Packers 29-22, to which is closer than the actual game was. The Lions played like garbage. Dallas blew out. Out the commanders, 45 to 10. Deron Bland with his record setting fifth pick six of the year, which is, I believe, still the same number of touchdowns, the same number of touchdown catches. Um, yeah, still the same number of touchdown catches as the New England Patriots wide receiver room as a whole has, which is absolutely baffling. And then the 49ers beating the Seahawks 31-13. to Sorry, Justin. That was not a game 
at all. I mean, the, the 49ers dominated pretty much the whole game, which I have Christian McCaffrey on my fantasy football team, which, so, okay. You know, I, I'm, I'm good with it to a certain extent. And then the Black Friday game, oh, my gosh, the Jets. The Jets, man. Jeez. I mean, okay, so Zach Wilson's not the answer, right? And you know Zach Wilson's not the answer. You're not getting Aaron Rodgers back. I don't see how he can come back at all this season, but he seems to think that he's going to be back. I don't know. So I guess, you know, Rodgers could be back at the end of the season, but until then, if you, you know, that's, you've got Zach Wilson, who you've decided is not the answer, which I think is the correct decision. He was getting the Jets nowhere. So then you turn to Tim Boyle. Tim Boyle in college, in his entire college football career, had more interceptions than touchdown passes. This was not a red flag to the Jets. So Tim Boyle starts, and I'm not sure that could have been a more disastrous game. I mean, the, the Hail Mary attempt at the end of the half, I had to laugh a little bit. The Hail Mary attempt at the end of the half, the Dolphins picked off at the one-yard line. And then Javon Holland runs it all the way back for a touchdown. I can't stand the Dolphins, but I was laughing hysterically because that's the most Jets thing I've ever seen in my life. But while we're on the subject of teams suffering bad losses, let's talk about the Bills. So... I'm not even sure where to start with this one, right? This was a game that, honestly, in order for the Bills to still have a shot at the AFC East, they needed to win. And Josh Allen was sensational. He was great. 29 of 51 passing, you know, completion, eh, whatever, completion percentage, maybe a tiny bit low, but... 339 yards passing, two touchdowns, one interception. Running the ball, ran it nine times for 81 yards and two touchdowns. Josh Allen was incredible. He made play after play. The Bills' offensive line, I thought, was excellent in this game. Josh Allen had time to throw pretty much the whole game. You know, I thought that I thought that the Bills offensively had a really nice game plan. And this is the second game in a row that I think Joe Brady has designed a really, really great game plan for the Bills offense. I mean, against two good defenses, they put up 32 against the Jets and they put up 34 against the Eagles on Sunday. That's two good defenses that you're putting 30 plus on. That's pretty good. You know, that's a that's a recipe for success on the offense. I thought the defense... The defensive line had an amazing start to this game. The defense was excellent in the first half. The only drawback in the first half, penalties. Now, I know a lot of people are rather miffed, upset, frustrated, if you will, about the officiating in this game, which I think is fair. I think this was a very poorly officiated game. Terribly. I thought Sean Hockley and his crew did an awful job calling this game. And I think they should be held accountable for that. Now, they won't be because the NFL never holds their refs or themselves accountable, ever. This is not my first day with you, Roger Goodell. I know how you operate things. You know, but you can't just blame the refs for losing. Some of those penalties were, yeah, some of those penalties were bad calls. You know, the the intentional grounding on Josh Allen when he was clearly being brought down by a horse collar tackle was unbelievable. And I was getting a little bit of deja vu at that point because on Saturday, as some of you who listen regularly know, I am an Auburn Tigers fan. And on Saturday, Saturday was the Iron Bowl, the big game against the Alabama Crimson Tide, the best rivalry in all of sports, I do believe. And 
There was a play early in this game where the Tigers were returning a kickoff following an Alabama touchdown. And the Auburn returner, who's a running back by the name of Brian Batty, was tackled via the face mask. Guy for Alabama, one of their defensive backs was at uh, Kendall Law, Kendrick Law, I think. Um, I think it was him. He grabs Batty by the face mask and turns his helmet around like 180 degrees and brings him down. Not only was that not called, but they called a block in the back on Auburn. I mean, like what? I was not happy. Not happy at all, as my family can attest to. And after that penalty, after that stuff happened in the Bills game, I was just laying on my floor of my dorm room, staring at the ceiling, thinking, oh my gosh, it's happening again, isn't it? It's happening again for the second day in a row. So you get late in the game, right? Here's And and the Eagles line up for a 59-yard field goal. Because Buffalo has the luck they have, you knew he was going to make it. Of course he made it. It's the Bills, of course. Of course it would happen against Buffalo. Of course. So the Bills get the ball back with 20 seconds left and one timeout. Because remember, we had to burn a timeout to ice the kicker because that hasn't worked in 15 years. 20 seconds left, one timeout. I want to call back what happened last year on Thanksgiving when the Bills played the Lions. They were driving down the field. Josh Allen needed less time than Josh Allen needed about nine seconds to get into field goal range. One deep pass to Diggs did the job. 20 seconds and one timeout. And you don't even let Josh Allen have the chance to get you into field goal range. And then a McDermott with some lame excuse of, ah, oh, well, you know, the uh, I thought the defensive line really did an ex, you know, defensive line of the Eagles really, you know, it's it's outweighing, outweighing risk versus reward. Because, because McDermott is a no-risk coach. He doesn't take chances ever. I understand that sometimes you have to be a little bit more conservative in your nature as a coach. But, oh my gosh, it is ridiculous how scared he is of taking even the slightest chance. You have Josh Allen at quarterback. You can take risks. Yes, he is going to make mistakes. He's also going to make incredible plays. He did that two years ago in Kansas City before you lost him the game, Sean. I shouldn't quite say that, but kind of. I mean, it, it, it's just, it is mind-boggling to me. Mind-boggling. I don't understand it. I just, I don't. And it, it, oh my gosh. It irritates the daylights out of me to see this happen constantly where the Bills are not taking enough chances because they're too, because Coach McDermott is too scared. It's, you've got, I'm seeing this idea, this mentality that coaches like that, coaches like Sean McDermott, they don't necessarily coach to win games. They coach to not lose games. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but you get what I mean, hopefully. That Josh Allen, or that, not Josh Allen, geez, that, you know, Sean McDermott is so afraid of making, quote unquote, the big mistake that, you know, he's so afraid of making, like I said, quote unquote, the big mistake that he doesn't take any chances or risks. You have to take some risks in this game. You have to. You've got Josh Allen at quarterback. I mean, what are we doing here? He kicks a field goal in overtime where a Josh Allen touchdown may have been able to win you the game. You just knew as soon as they kicked that field goal and they gave the Eagles the ball back, you just knew it was over because that's how it always happens to the Bills. They lose games like that over and over and over. Josh Allen is now 0-6 in overtime in his career. And I would be willing to say about half of those losses were not his fault. 
I mean, you can't blame Sunday on him. You can't blame the 13 seconds loss on him. Yes, the overtime loss to the Texans in the playoffs back in 2019. Okay, yeah, Josh didn't play well then. Week one this year. Okay, yeah, Josh didn't play well. Against the Vikings last year. Uh, maybe, maybe you can blame him for that. Against Tampa. Okay, yeah, bad first half. Second half, he was amazing. Defense needed to bail him out. Couldn't do it. And it just, it, it blows my mind. I just, I don't know how many more times Buffalo's going to lose a game like that. I don't understand it. And I already said a lot of this on fifth quarter on Monday. But I don't know how many more times Buffalo has to lose a game like this until Coach McDermott is going to realize that he might need to take some chances. Instead of constantly coaching safe, coaching scared, that's how you turn into Marty Schottenheimer. And I don't mean that as a slight towards Coach Schottenheimer. He was an excellent coach in his day. What I mean by that is, remember Coach Schottenheimer, it was his teams, the knock on him was always that they were never successful in the playoffs. You know, so I think that McDermott, I mean, as far as this season is concerned, you pretty much have to win out if you want a shot at the playoffs. If you lose one more game, you fin- you got five games left. You lose, you go four and one the rest of the way out. You finish 10 and seven. That might be good enough to get you in, but with how good the AFC is, I don't know. If you lose multiple games, you are done. In this conference, you have to get to 10 wins just to have a chance to make the playoffs the way it's been this year. I don't know. I I just, I'm tired of seeing the Bills lose games like this time and time again. I'm going to take a short break and then come back and make my quick picks, but hopefully things can turn around for Buffalo because I'm tired of losing games like this. Simply put, thanks for tuning in to Big Blue Sports Podcast. Be back in a few minutes. Running out for the next door's garden before the hour is done It's more a question of feeling than it is a question of fun The confidence is the ballot club, I'm sure you'll baffle them good With the ending reek of salty cheeks and runny makeup alone Or we'll put a run down the face of a boy with a little scorn You'll find yourself in a skirmish where you wish you'd never been born You'll tie yourself to the tracks and there isn't no going back From a burning building, I'm throwing it to the sharks. Club. 
You're listening to WCVF 88.9 FM, the voice voice of Fredonia. And welcome back to Big Blue Sports Podcast. So to finish off off our show this morning, I want to make my NFL picks real fast. So Thursday night at 8.15, the Seahawks heading into Dallas to take on the Cowboys. 93% of voters, according to ESPN, are going with Dallas in this game. I'm also going to pick the Cowboys. Sorry, Justin. I just think that Dallas is... Dallas is red hot right now. They're 8-3, and three, and I think they improved to 9-3 and three with a win. Then we get into the Sunday 1 o'clock games. Remember, the Bills are on their bye week this week. The 6-5 six, <clears throat> the six and five Colts heading into Tennessee to take on the 4-7 and seven Titans. 73% of voters are going with the Colts, and I have to agree. I'm still not sold on the Titans, and I think that Indianapolis right now, they're playing well. They're feeling it. Shane Steichen has been a great hire so far this year. I think the Colts get the win. The Chargers heading into New England to take on the Patriots. Chargers at 4-7, and Patriots 2-9. and 95% of voters going with the Chargers. I agree. The Patriots, this is the, I mean, this is is like the year of disaster for the Patriots. And I think that it's going to be hard to pull themselves out of that. The Lions heading into New Orleans to take on the Saints. 93% of voters going with the Lions. And I got to pick Detroit. I think they bounce back from their Thanksgiving rough showing and beat the Saints down in the Bayou. The Falcons heading to New Jersey to take on the Jets. 61% of voters going with the Falcons. Normally, I wouldn't pick Atlanta, but they're playing the Jets, so I'm definitely picking Atlanta. Uh, The Cardinals heading to Pittsburgh to take on the Steelers in a Super Bowl 43 rematch. 93% of voters going with Pittsburgh. I will also go with the Steelers, although Arizona could keep this game close. The Dolphins heading into Washington to take on the Commanders. 98% of voters going with Miami. I will also pick the Dolphins in this game. The Denver Broncos headed to Houston to take on the Texans. Both teams 6-5. and 64% of voters are going with the Texans. This is going to be a fascinating game. It's certainly going to be interesting. I think Houston picks up the win, even though Denver is on a roll right now. At 4.05, the Carolina Panthers heading into Tampa Bay to take on the Bucs. 93% of voters going with Tampa Bay. I'll also go with Tampa, although Carolina, again, could make this a game in their first game in the post-Frank Reich era. 425 games, the Browns heading to L.A. to take on the Rams. 59% of voters going with the Rams. I'm actually going to go with Cleveland in this game. I don't know. I think Cleveland is able to pull off the win here. 425, oh boy, is this going to be a good one. The 49ers heading into Philadelphia to take on the Eagles. 55% of voters going with the Eagles. I'm going the other way. I think San Francisco wins this one. Sunday Night Football at 820, the Chiefs heading up to Green Bay to take on the Packers. 93% of voters going with the Chiefs. I'm going to pick the Chiefs, but I think the Packers will keep this game really close. And then Monday Night Football, the Bengals heading to Jacksonville to take on the Jags. 91% of voters going with Jacksonville. This game has lost its luster since Joe Burrow got injured. I think Jacksonville wins this one in somewhat of a landslide, to be completely honest with you. And the Bills, of course, on their bye week, and then they will return to action on December 10th when they head to Kansas City for a 425 matchup with the Chiefs. So that'll do it for this episode of Big Blue Sports Podcast. Believe it or not, next week is the last show. How crazy is that? I know a lot of you are probably heartbroken to hear that, but you can catch me today on News at Noon and on Friday for High Noon Friday and at Radiothon. Make sure you tune in for Radiothon. We will catch you next week. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in this week. Be well and go Blue Devils.